appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and the invitation as well. So there are three developmental stages through which you will pass if you are a disruptive or, as we say, non-compliant patient in the hospital. The first stage is that we take away your roommate because you can be a pain in the ass, but you can't be a pain in the ass to anybody else you're sharing space with. <laughs> so you are alone. If you continue in this behavior, we then move you to the most distant available room on the floor. So now you are alone and you are isolated. And if you continue to persist in this behavior, then we have a third step, a third stage in development where we immediately think of every possible task that we need to do prior to answering your call bell. So now you are alone and isolated and ignored. You are in a medical no-fly zone, a world all unto yourself. And when I was rounding recently with my little minions straight out of, you know, whatever, Grey's Anatomy, multiple heights, multiple lengths, uh, the white coats all looking very stern, trailing along behind me, we came around a corner and we walked right into one of these no-fly zones which, as it turns out, was the patient that I was about to inherit. And as we rounded the corner and came to the room, we heard cursing and yelling and screaming, as sometimes happens. And my, my very diligent medical student, who feels as if she needs to move the process forward, stops us in front of the room, starts into her presentation. This is a 26-year-old female with a past history of IV drug abuse who presents with fever and chest pain and shortness of breath. She has probable endocarditis, and she's refusing treatment. So let me just stop right here, because that's not an adequate description. This is a young woman who was, in fact, 26 years old. She does, in fact, use IV drugs. She had <coughs> taken some of the natural environment of the world, not from her gut, but from her skin, and she had manipulated it, not on the macro scale, but on the one-to-one -one scale. And she had gotten staphylococcal bacteria into her bloodstream, but not just into her bloodstream, into virtually every piece of her living tissue. She had one kidney that was entirely infection. There was no kidney to be seen. Her heart was infected. Every joint in her body was completely filled with this staphylococcal infection and it had reached her lungs and was actually eroding, eating away her lung into her airway. So refusing therapy was not just like, God, I've got allergies, maybe I'll take Benadryl, maybe I won't. <laughs> this was a life or death situation. She was literally killing herself by refusing to participate in her care. So I did what I do sometimes under these circumstances. I stopped the conversation we were having outside the room, and much to the chagrin of my medical residents, who were all very pressed for time, we all traipsed into the room, and we sat down at the patient's bedside, and we just shut up and let her talk for almost an hour. And I have 18 minutes, so Google condense. <laughs> but here's the story. She had arrived at a point partly due to her own behavior, but also partly due to the way that we were reacting to her, where she believed, rightfully, that everyone had decided that she was a drug abuser, she had done this to herself, she deserved what she got. And her primary complaint was that this hurt, and let me tell you, this would hurt. But she's a drug abuser, so she's really actually just faking it to get the medicine that she wants. This was the story we had constructed around her. And she was, quite literally, willing to die to refute that story. Her medical story. 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 We will all eventually write the story of how we die. This is the only slide I've got. I am not a PowerPoint kind of guy. <laughs> the essence 
of participating in your own life, and as it relates to how I will interact with you someday, your medical life. It is a story, an extraordinary story. Now, I'm, a, I'm an educator and a medical educator, and so I'm constantly being evaluated by students who have to write out those evaluation forms. The students in the room, you know this, right? The lecture, the med lecture, whatever. So I try to be as helpful as I can to my students, and I point out, when they're filling out my evaluations, that extraordinary is actually spelled extraordinary, so they don't get it wrong on my evaluation. <laughs> but I think it's an important point because it is, in fact, extraordinary in a couple of different ways. This process of constructing your own personal medical narrative is really, in fact, extraordinary. Extra in the sense of outside the ordinary. Unless we are ill, unless someone we love is ill, the process of thinking about the story of your medical health is not an ordinary activity. There are people for whom it is ordinary. I think of Woody Allen immediately. And you can imagine what it's like to live with somebody who's always creating this story. But it's not ordinary. It is extraordinary. On the other hand, it's also extraordinary in this other way that we use extra meaning very, very ordinary. We will all eventually write the story of how we die. And in actuality, we are doing it every moment that we're alive. If not how we die, at least this kind of ever-shifting relationship we have with our health and our wellness and our illness and our sense of impending doom, and if you're Woody Allen, the fact that at any moment you will die. It is extraordinary in every sense. And it's also extraordinary to me the way that this medical narrative is actually not just about you, but actually weaves in pieces of other people's stories. The stories that the nurses were writing for this patient. The story that my medical student was trying to tell about this patient, all woven together with the story that the patient was trying to create. This young woman, 26 years old and on death's door, as ill as I have ever seen anyone that I didn't bury. It's extraordinary to me the way these weave together, the pieces of this medical narrative. And there are lots of ways to think about this, but I want to just sort of describe what I think of as being kind of six inter interrelated threads to the medical narrative. At the kind of lowest or most <coughs> basic level, there's the, I have something wrong, I need you to do something about it. I have pain, I'd like you to make it feel better. I have allergies, I'd like to not have allergies anymore. From the patient's perspective, there's a very basic level need. They'd like to be able to tell a story that somebody can understand so that we can have an interaction and they can make it better. This seems very straightforward, and yet, as you can see from this kind of example, it gets wrapped up in other stories. But let's just leave that thread there for a moment because it's important because fundamentally if I don't understand what it is you asked for in the first place, I'm giving you an aspirin for your cold and that may not be what you need. On sort of the other side of the street, there is what the medical student was trying to do, which is a very basic medical narrative story. This is a 26-year-old woman with a past history of IV drug abuse who presents with fever and chest pain and shortness of breath, and she is working overtime to come up with a narrative thread that helps explain medically what's going on and allows her to transmit that information to me in a way that I will understand and on which we can then act. And I actually initially got interested in the whole idea of storytelling in medicine because medical students, despite the fact that they are all very bright individuals, cannot for the life of them tell a simple, straightforward story. Holy crap. How old is this person? What is she complaining about? How's it been going on? They can tell me in great deal what they did Saturday night at the bar. And they can't get a simple point A to point B medical story. And that was my initial introduction to the idea that maybe there's a storytelling element here that we should be focusing on. These two are linked, right? It's kind of basic level storytelling. 
patient has a story to tell, and we have a way in which we need to take that information and be able to tell the story in sort of Dr. E's, if you will. It's not very sophisticated, but it's absolutely essential. And then there's another level, which is not so much the facts of the story, although they're still in there, but there's the thread of what this means. So sitting in the room listening to this patient talk, it was one thing to hear about the cough and the fever and the chills and the pain and the drug abuse. But she had a whole additional story. My god, I am swollen up. I look like that Stay Puff Marshmallow guy from mm -hmm. Ghostbusters. This is not me. This is not how I look. I'm ugly, and I am not usually like this. I can't believe I did this to myself. I know that I've been doing this. I know that it's not healthy. I know that on some level this is my responsibility. But fundamentally, I can't believe I did this to myself. I can't believe this is the way I am going to die. In a hospital, swollen, ugly, yelling, screaming, alone, isolated, and ignored. That cannot be my story. And on the other side, at this same level, is what this means for individuals who are hearing that story. So let me give you just a couple of examples, because I think this was fabulous. On the one hand, of course, in medicine, we all love what we refer to as great cases. And you yourselves should hope that you never hear the word outside your hospital room. <laughs> God, that's a great case. <laughs> because if you hear that, you are dead. <laughs> you never want to be a great case. It means something really yucky, awful, horrible, went on that only a doctor could love. <laughs> no patient ever wants to be a great case. But this was a great case, and there's a lot to be learned from this, and there were many, many important medical issues that we could frame around this story. There's actually a pending publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a picture of her lung, because nobody would ever seen one that eroded quite like this on the basis of this infection. But let me tell you an even better story here. The young woman, that my medical student, who started this conversation, 26-year-old female IV drug abuser, not cooperating with care. She was going to be an obstetrician. She's going to deliver babies. She's a fourth-year medical student right now, which is where they start to decide what they want to do when they grow up. They're not just going to be a medical student anymore. They're not going to be some kind of generic vanilla doctor. They're going to be a flavor doctor. So she was going to be an obstetrician. She worked with this woman over the entire six weeks that she was in the hospital, and it fundamentally changed her life. She has completely changed the direction she plans to go in medicine. This case, with the identity of the patient, obviously safeguarded, became the core of her personal statement in her application for residency training. At this level, it fundamentally has the power to alter the understanding, not only of what it means for the patient, but for what it means for the individuals who are involved in the care of those patients. On the sort of higher level, maybe it's not higher, but on the third level as I'm conceptualizing this, there is the back and forth communication that this story, in which this story has to play out. I need to do this, but I can't do that. You want this, but I'm going to need this from you. I told you this. That's not what you heard. You told me that something. That's not what I heard. It's like a marriage. It's like a marriage. I'm sure I told you that. I told you you needed to pick up the kids after school. You nodded and promised me you would do it. WTF. <laughs> And this story weaves through that as we try to make this work as an ongoing relationship between the individuals who are caring for this patient 
and the patient, in this case, herself. And then, at sort of what I think of as the very highest level, is what I'm calling the meta story. Because we're in an academic setting and everything eventually becomes meta something, right? <laughs> the meta story, which is thinking about the fact that at one point in time, you need to be picking up one thread of this story. And then you'll need to set it down, and you'll need to pick up another thread. And you'll need to take your narrative shuttle. For those of you who are weavers in the crowd, your narrative shuttle to weave the story that comes out to the entire tapestry, which is the narrative picture of what this experience meant, not only for the patient, alone and isolated in her room, but for everyone woven together in that experience. The basic information, the framework of meaning for the person who is ill and the people who need to take care of those individuals, the back and forth communication that allows us to actually function in the world of medicine, and a sensitivity to the fact that this story needs to be carefully and thoughtfully woven using all of those threads of narrative. In the hospital, I don't know if you know this, but in the hospital, every time you go home, there's a requirement that we write a summary story of what happened. It's called a discharge summary. And in a teaching hospital, the beauty of being an attending physician is I never have to do that. It's the responsibility of the resident. And the way this works, she stayed for three and a half months. I had multiple residents over the time that I was taking care of her. The way this works from a functional standpoint, last person out turns off the lights. So I had a resident who started literally two days before she went home from her three and a half months in the hospital. And he gets the discharge summary responsibility. And he says to me, Dr. Lyon, it's been three and a half months. So much has happened to her in the hospital. I can't ever get this done. So much has happened. And I just nodded and I said, you have no idea. Thank you very much.